using like a, a, a television station or a radio station as an example, they are always broadcasting. They're always broadcasting the same thing to everyone. They are not selective in who they broadcast what to. It's the same broadcast that goes out to everyone. And that's the same way it is with God. He is not selective in, in, in revealing himself to us. He's not selective in who he reveals himself to and who, who, who he doesn't reveal himself to. In all that he has and in all that he is, he is broadcasting, so to say, in his grace and in his favor. So if, if, if God says he is here, we can expect to have all that he is because he's not selective in the distribution of his goodness to some people why he withdraws it from others. For example, if I'm here, my fingernails are here, my toes are here, my hands are here. Everything that is part of me is here with me. I cannot leave my head somewhere else and be somewhere. That's the same way it is with God. Wherever God is, his presence is, wherever his presence is, all that he has, all that he is, is there with him. Glory to God. And the problem is always with man, not with God. Because like a TV station is always broadcasting. We change the dial. We, we take the remote, we tune to somewhere else. We go from CBS to Fox to CNN. Many times, depending on if what they're saying interests us. So we change channels all the time until we find what interests us. Then we, we stay on the channel. But God is constantly, constantly revealing himself to whoever wants to know him, one, secondly, to the extent that they want to know him. He says, I am the Lord, I change not. And the whole of this is to make us appreciate that he is still the same God. In the, in the, in the ways, in the systems of this world, we define people by their works. So we see an artist, we look at his painting and we say he's good. Because, wow, you mean you painted this? You are so good. We look at a musician, we see his songs, we listen to his songs or his rap, and we say they are good. And vice versa, we look at other people's works and say, oh, yeah, not quite good enough. And that's, now, that's exactly the way the world judges good and bad, by the works that someone does. Now, the problem with that with defining an artist by his work, and I hope we're all getting this, is that that whole concept depends on my appreciation level as a consumer of the work. My rating of a writer depends on my appreciation of good writing. So if the work is fantastic, but my appreciation level of good writing is not high enough, I'm not going to appreciate the person. The whole concept depends on my appreciation. If a, if a painter or an artist, if the, rating, the rating of an artist depends on my appreciation of the work. For example, my appreciation, my personally, my appreciation of jazz music started um, maybe when I was like around 15 or 16, but I had been playing music and listening to music most of my life as, a, as, a, as, a, as an eight-year-old, as a 10-year-old, as a 12-year-old. But I, I never really began to appreciate jazz music until my brother introduced me to, uh, um, to jazz music. Then that's when I began to appreciate um, my jazz music and my appreciation for jazz increased to the point that I began to pay money to buy jazz albums. Before then, if I was in position to rate good music, I wouldn't rate jazz music as good music. And that's not because jazz music is not a top music. It's not 
highly, um, it's not a high value music. It's just because my appreciation of it was not high up there. God is already as good as he's going to be. Your understanding of him is what needs to increase. Your appreciation of him is what needs to increase. It's only, and it only increases with our knowledge of him. God is not good because his works are good. His works are good because he is good. So your relationship with God cannot be better than your knowledge of him. We only relate to God as much as we know him. So what's wrong is not with God, it's with us. We're the ones who need to know him better. We relate to him only to the extent that we know him, not necessarily to the extent of his greatness but to the extent that we know him. So, and this is what usually then is the effect. Many times, even as mature Christians, young Christians, older Christians, we kind of mentally construct an image of God in our heads. Especially the one that's convenient, the one that's comfortable, the one that we're comfortable with. We tend to basically define and construct the God we want to worship. And we begin to worship that God, the God of our mental construction. We have to remember that he is not who we say he is. He is who he says he is. He is not just who we think he is, he is who he says we, he is. We are only the works of his hands and his works don't define him, he defines his works. So you are who he says you are, not necessarily who you think you are. So, I can go off and on and on and say, I'm Yemi, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that, I'm that, and describe myself. But if it doesn't line up with who he says I am, that description is not accurate. So many times, lots of times we we have this mental construction of God. This is who we think he is. But it's, the Lord says something in his word in Exodus 23 to 4, which is very, very critical to our discussion today. He says, thou shall serve no other God besides me. This is how exactly says it. Thou shall serve no other God before me. Thou shall not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything mm -hmm. that is in heaven above or that is on earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Many of us, now here's the interpretation of this. Many of us worship the God we created in our head. We have an idea of God and that, that mental construction of God is what we think he is. Oh, everybody kind of carries some kind of picture of God in their wallet. And they think that that's the God that has to be who God is. Have you ever wondered why some people see God in a certain way that you don't? That's why. And some people think that God is judgmental and is always just looking to judge people and to whip them, and you don't, that's the difference between you and them. Have you seen people who are very transactional in their relationship with God and somebody that is so, whose idea of God is more of love, driven by love? That's the difference. 
Many of us worship the God we created, not the God that created us. There's only one God, and he cannot be changed. He cannot be modified. He cannot be reconstructed. Every time we create an image of God that's not him, or that doesn't fully represent him, we are worshiping an image. So another form of idol worship is to create an image of God based on what he is not. Because that image that he says you shall not have doesn't have to be a physical image. It can be a mental image that we created that's not a reflection of the true living God. Oh, yes. If you ask me, this is one of the problems we have in the body of Christ, in the church and in the world today. Everybody, people have a, uh, an idea of and a picture of God that they created. And remember, it doesn't have to be a physical image. So that scripture again, Exodus 2, 34, look at this scripture in the light. Don't look at it in the light of a golden calf placed somewhere physically. Because now we're in the new covenant. We are in the New Testament where everything in the Old Testament was a symbol and a foreshadow. So what would be the New Testament inter interpretation of Exodus 23 to 4? Let me read Exodus 23 to 4 again. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven or above or that is under the earth or beneath that's in the water or under the earth. That image doesn't have to be a physical image. It can be a mental image. In fact, many people are addicted and committed to the God that they created without willing to shift to the left or to the right because of a set of doctrines and dogmas and principles and all of that that we have formed based on our idea of who God is. There's only one God and he cannot be changed. He is who he says he is. He cannot be modified. He cannot be reconstructed. We like to worship God in our own terms. We like to create a mental image of God that's compatible to our flesh, to our habits, to our carnal propensities. We nicely carve out that image of God and we begin to relate with it as God. We carve out an image that excludes the things we don't like and includes the things we like. And to us, that's God. Truth cannot be defined as anything you agree with. If that's the definition of truth, anything I agree with, oh, the world will be chaotic, I tell you. So it means there are things I don't agree with that's true. And there are things that I agree with that's not true. Someone once said, God created us in his image, but we turned around and created God in our own image. So we basically worship a God that we created. God changes people, but he himself does not change. And our relationship with God cannot be better than our knowledge of him. We can't relate with God better than we know him. And God is absolute, so to say. He is who he is. But your knowledge of him is not absolute. We know in part, we prophesy in part, we grow in the knowledge of God. So why should I put a tone of finality on who I, what I know or who I know God to be? Actually, our prayer should be these three things. Lord, I want to see me the way you see me. 
And secondly, I want to see others the way you see them. <laughs> there are people in our lives that when we begin to see them the way God sees them, everything changes. There are people we've written off that when we begin to see them the way God sees them, it changes everything. There are people who have written us off that if they begin to see us the way God sees us, it changes everything. So the first prayer, and we're going to pray for a little while before we speak or talk today. I want to see me, the, I want to see me the way you see me. Secondly, I want to see others the way you see them. Oh, that's what such grace. And then the third one is, I want to see the world the way you see it. That is such a powerful place. There's no, there is no more, there's no place more powerful to see you the way God sees you. It changes everything. To see others the way God sees them. Oh, wow. It changes everything. It changes everything. More, and then to see the world the way God sees it, it changes everything. Most of the things we get angry at, at people that are not our race or people that are not our tribe or people that are not our family and things like that. If we will look one layer lower the surface, we we'll probably begin to see why they might have done what they did. And if we go a little lower, we begin uh, a, a, a layer down, we begin to see, well, maybe it's their childhood. Maybe things happen to them in their childhood. Maybe it's not their fault after all. And if we go a, lo a layer down, we begin to see, wow. There's no way you look beyond, there's no time you go beyond the surface that it doesn't unlock compassion from your heart. It makes you go easy on yourself more than how hard you used to go. It makes you go easy on others more than how hard you used to go. The compassion of Christ is not always on the surface. If you really want to go to see things the way Christ sees it, you've got to go beyond the surface of anything. It's never in the surface. It's never on face value. It's never on face value. Because on face value, we will judge each other. We will fight each other. We will, we will reject each other. We will, I mean, there's so much that happens on the face, on the surface. But it takes going a layer down. Every, most times that Jesus healed people, the Bible says, and he had compassion on them. <laughs> That's the first thing the Bible says. Is that, is that just a cliche? It can't be. It has to be that healing starts with compassion for us and for others. Whether for us and through us. Let me say it like that. If healing is going to happen to us or through us, compassion has to take its place. And Jesus saw the multitude and he had compassion on them. Really? How can healing take place without compassion? If I have, if we're going to be in good relationship with myself and my wife, there's got to be compassion for each other. So if there are things I'm trying to explain to her, if she, if, if she locks out compassion, she can't see it. And same thing with me. Glory to God. So, Lord, I want to see me the way you see me. Secondly, I want to see others the way you see them. That changes everything. And I want to see the world the way you see it. I renounce every work of iniquity. I disengage from the God that I created. And fully embrace the true God that I am, that I am. Because he says, I am the Lord, I change not. I am the Lord, I change not. He is still the same, the same God. Can we just close our eyes and begin to speak to God? It just take like five minutes and just, let's just pray and just ask 
and begin to reach out to God's throne. That first, Lord, I want to see me the way you see me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your goodness, your kindness, your love, your favor. We ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we desire to see ourselves, to see us the way you see us. Oh, if this means digging deeper in your word, we will. If this means searching deeper in your word, we will. And we receive the spirit of humility, oh, and compassion. First of all, to see us the way you see us. Because we realize that if we don't see ourselves the way you see us, we will judge others with the same high standards. Sometimes with the world, with the same false standards. My God. My, in the name of Jesus, Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, in the name of Jesus, that we may see ourselves, that I may see me the way you see me, that I may see me the way you see me, that I may see me the way, open my eyes, open the eyes of my heart, oh God, open the eyes of my understanding, oh God, to see me like never before, that the scales may be taken off of my eyes. Every scale, we take them off in the name of Jesus. We command every scale to be taken off in the name as God has given us the authority. Oh, he says, whatever we bind in heaven is bound on earth. And whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. We bind every scale, every generational scale, every uh, associational scale, everything that has blinded our eyes. Oh, we, 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 we say, be thou removed in the name of Jesus. From today, we begin to see ourselves different. We begin to see ourselves in a new light. And we begin to pray concerning others too. Lord, we want to see others in a new way. In the name of Jesus, we renounce all our old ways. We renounce our selfish ways, self-centered ways. Oh, thank you, Lord. We renounce every selfishness. We renounce every self-centeredness, oh God. In the name of Jesus, we put you first. We trust you to be able to supply all our needs. We trust you to be able to meet us at the point of our needs. We trust that you are able to do exceeding abundantly, far above, just like you said in your word. Therefore, we put you first. And we say that people around us will begin to see a change in us, even right now from this moment in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we'll begin to see that we begin to see the world the way you see it. In the name of Jesus, we renounce every walk of the flesh. We disengage from the God that we created and fully embrace the God that you are. The I am, the Jehovah, Yahweh, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the great I am, the I am that I am in the name of Jesus. We declare that from today we are changed. We are changed people in the name of Jesus. We thank you, O oh God, and we bless you. We bless your name. We give you all the praise. In the name of Jesus, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you all. God bless you. Let me take it out of my phone. Okay. What? What are your thoughts on today's um, discussion? Let's hear the pastors speak to us now. <laughs> The evangelists. Um, I thought it was very important how Let's you go started. Ahead. Um, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yes. Sure. Okay. I thought it was amazing how you started.